So welcome, everybody. Uh, hope everybody had a good lunch break. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, hope you had a good uh, lunch break, too, even if it wasn't lunchtime for you. Uh, I'm Jeremy Grant. I'm a managing director in Venables Technology and Innovation Group. I also serve as an advisor to FIDO Alliance, helping them with government engagement across the world. And when it comes to engagement with FIDO, there isn't any government in the world that's been more engaged on issues involving FIDO authentication than the U.S. government. Uh, in my role in FIDO, I often get asked uh, by different FIDO members, so what does the U.S. government think about FIDO authentication? So when I was asked to put a panel together uh, for the Authenticate conference, we uh, called it, so what does the U.S. government think about FIDO authentication? <laughs> so just setting the stage, uh, from a 2022 White House policy that called for the use of phishing-resistant authentication across U.S. government systems, to new draft NIST guidance that re is recognizing synced pass keys, the U.S. government's been embracing FIDO authentication to address a number of enterprise and consumer use cases. We've got a great panel today that's going to explore how policymakers and regulators and agency implementers are all thinking about FIDO. Um, the panel today is mostly people from the U.S. government, or in Christine's case, someone who is closely supporting an agency <laughs> or two to talk about their perspectives I'm the on how government can best be using FIDO authentication. So I wanted to just briefly ask everyone to introduce themselves, explain who they are, the role they play, and then we'll get into the panel. Ryan. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Ryan Galuzzo, uh, the Applied Cybersecurity Division Identity Program Lead at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, in that role, I, uh, I, I work very closely on the digital identity guidelines where I'm a co-author, um, but also work to coordinate across a number of different programs that have purview on identity, so including working with our colleagues in the personal identity verification or PIV um, side of the house, uh, working on the work uh, that we do as well around mobile driver's license um, and various other aspects of authentication and access management. And all of these things kind of get touched on to a certain degree by some of the work that's being done within FIDO and, and W3C around web authent as well, too. Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Ken Myers. I'm with the General Services Administration. I'm actually currently on detail to login.gov to help them with uh, identity verification compliance. But my, uh, my day job, I'm the Director for Identity Assurance and Trusted Access in the Office of Government Policy. That might sound like I actually operate something for GSA. We actually work closely with the Office of Management and Budget to help them implement government-wide policy, specifically in digital identity. So we have like core, four core functions. Um, one is just coordination, so under the federal CISO Council, we have an ICAM subcommittee that make policy recommendations, identify best practices. Those best practices become what we call playbooks that end up on idmanagement.gov. Um, another is we help uh, manage the shared service provider program for public key infrastructure. Uh, we also test a limited set of products specific to personal identity verification. So we test the smart card and we also test physical access control systems. Um, and the, uh, the last functional part of our office is maintaining the government-wide digital certificate policy that we call the federal PKI common policy. So thanks for inviting me, Jeremy. Thanks. Courtney, who, by the way, is her face is hiding behind the shield there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was yeah. I am, I'm actually really disappointed we don't have the physical shield I, with us. I know. I, like, I thought I'd get like, the shield and maybe like a sword. <laughs> no? Um, so I'm Courtney Racy. I'm the Deputy Director of Identity Assurance at the IRS, uh, everybody's favorite government agency. Um, so in Identity Assurance, we own the policy for external facing services, so for taxpayers, tax professionals, uh, around authentication, authorization, and access. Um, we own some systems there as well. We do, we work with login and another credential service provider um, for access to online services. Uh, one of the big things that we're looking at right now and part of the reason that I'm super excited to be here at Authenticate is, you know, we have a system in place for creation of a digital identity and access for online, uh, but as we saw uh, during the clips on the, the keynote, the non-digital channels can then provide a loophole for fraudsters to be able to get into systems. And so one thing that we're trying to do is to create um, more seamless and secure access across all of our service channels, digital and non-digital. 
in a way where we're truly authenticating someone after they've done that initial uh, identity proofing. So super excited to be here. Thank you. And I'm Christine Owen. I'm a director at GuideHouse. I help uh, clients um, implement IAM and Zero Trust Solutions. Uh, I also think I'm probably one of the biggest thorns in both Ryan and Ken's uh, side, so I apologize, Never. but I don't because sometimes they need it. <laughs> Thanks. So let me start with Ryan. A um, lot of questions around what's going on with the update of Special Publication 863 and where that stands. What can you share with us? Um, pretty much, I, I would say, status quo based upon what we presented uh, uh, in July. But you know, we've gone through and we, we got about 3,900 comments when we were when all was said and done, uh, coming from a wide range of different stakeholders. We have adjudicated about 90% of those, um, so we are pretty much through the process of evaluating and understanding what's the impact going to be. Um, there will be some more formal communication coming from us on, on what the actual plan of release is going to be for each one of the volumes. But what I can say and what we, you know, we've said previously is um, you know, we pretty much anticipate that there will be another public draft of the base volume, uh, 863A, and most likely 863C. Um, the reasons that we're going to go down that pathway are based upon the volume of changes as well as some of the changes that we've received um, public comments on around uh, things like uh, integration of verifiable credentials and mobile driver's license into the identity proofing side of the house, um, attempting to address some of the major changes that we made to the risk management process within the base volume. All those are going to require probably another round of gaining feedback. Um, 863B, which is the one that I think most folks in here are familiar with and love and um, acknowledge on a daily basis, um, is probably the most stable out of all of them and most likely um, to, to go directly to a, a final version. Um, but that being said, there are still some key components that we're trying to add in there, obviously some of them around synced passkey or synced authenticators, um, as well as how we address things like the verifiable credential component that might include authentication. So um, still, I think, on path for what we'd like to see is uh, around a March, April time frame for the next version of each one, uh, but still dealing with some major issues and getting through some of the final comments as well, too. So diving into 63B, which deals with authentication, I know one of the things that you've been uh, tasked with doing is updating the definition of what phishing resistance means, and that in 2017 it pointed, I think, to the token binding standard, which doesn't really, never really caught on, hasn't been used. How are you thinking about updating the definition of phishing resistance? Well, so I don't think we plan on updating from this particular version, but what we did do in this, this last draft was cover the two different pathways that we see to achieving phishing resistance. Um, one was binding uh, through the, the actual kind of communication channel, which you would see more in a PKI, PIV kind of infrastructure, and the other is binding from uh, something like domain or origin, which is what you see more commonly in something like uh, FIDO or WebAuthn. So we are acknowledging that you can achieve phishing resistance um, at AAL3 through each one of those pathways. Now, I think the big um, one of the big challenges we're attempting to address now is how syncable authenticators kind of change the game when it comes to what our guidance needs to address. Um, we've been fairly public at this point, I think, about kind of noting that AAL2, and it actually Dean's presentation this morning did a really good job, um, syncable authenticators were really kind of placing into that AAL2 bucket because of the change in context, the ability to move key material from the actual authenticator to a, a cloud fabric for syncing, um, kind of changes the, the, the algorithm there. Um, we are also attempting to deal with some things like the concept of sharing, right, which is not something that um, was explicitly a, an aspect of authenticators prior to this. It's something that you kind of anticipate a user would do, um, but the very explicit capability to share those credentials um, creates some new considerations when it comes to how we should be applying um, our thinking around this. And, and I'll say we've, we've started to look, and this is one of the few things we've ever really done this with, but potentially actually applying a set of controls and considerations for a public-facing use case and a, a kind of enterprise-facing use case because the contexts are so different, right? In, an, uh, in, a, in a kind of enterprise use case, you're likely to have a bit more control over the device. You're likely to have the ability to apply things like um, policies through mobile device management or through managed accounts. Whereas when you've got something coming in from the outside, from, you know, from a, a public facing perspective, you're likely to have a lot less control and a lot less visibility. Um, 
And again, I thought Dean's presentation this morning was really good, laying out that threat model. And some of the things we're actually explicitly thinking about, like making sure we build in um, user notification of synced credentials, user notification of what it means to have a synced credential, um, building in things on the enterprise side, like being able to have that policy management and policy control on the device. Um, and some of the challenges we are seeing there as well, too, is where do we draw the line between what goes into 863B, what goes into 800.157-1, which is our derived authenticator guidance, which is more specific to the PIV context, um, and what actually needs to be updated from a consideration perspective in like mobile security, um, because there's certain things that'll be that'll play in there as well too. So we're working through all that, but you know, again, I think the key takeaway is AAL2 for synced authenticators with some additional controls that we're really looking to apply. More thinking about how we protect the keys that have now been synced outside of the authenticator. Actually, you took my next question as well. I was going to ask you all about how are you thinking about uh, syncable pass keys. Um, I, I did want to flag um, when FIDO Alliance submitted its comments on the draft earlier this year, one of the things we actually noted was that it would be good to have some additional guidance from this in terms of the things you're talking about because this idea of a sync fabric, which is something that didn't necessarily exist, at least commonly in the authentication world, is certainly a really big thing. And so thinking about uh, how to uh, secure it for different types of use cases uh, and what you know guidelines you might want to see there is going to be quite important I don't know if you have any. yeah I mean I think the big the big challenge there for us is again on the federal enterprise side there's a lot more we can say about sync fabrics because we can push people towards specific products and specific certifications like FIPS 140 the challenge is once you start applying that on the on the consumer side, you don't have that same control, and you can't possibly expect everyone who's out there to only be bringing you, um, you know, synced authenticators that have been synced to a FIPS 140 FedRAMP approved high infrastructure or something like that. So I think you know, being able to differentiate those things, and I think in particular on the public facing side, one of the things we want to make sure is really well addressed is account recovery and the fact that we don't want to undermine the multi-factor aspects of what comes with a with a synced authenticator by having really poor recovery processes. So again, we're reevaluating our own account recovery section, but also making sure that if we're going to point to things like synced authenticators where you've got that private key stored somewhere, you've got a strong set of controls around recovery to make sure you aren't undermining that authenticator. Thanks. Ken, I wanted to shift to you. You mentioned your role in OGP. A lot of it is working uh, with uh, the White House Office of Management and Budget to translate some of the policies into action. Um, I know there's been a big role that you've been playing in you know, what uh, the White House has called, I think it was the White House we named this, the FIDO Community of Action. Mm -hmm. And wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about it and what it means for agencies. Yeah, yeah, of course. So uh, I guess it was almost about a year and a half ago, about four to five months after um, the Federal Zero Trust Strategy was published. Uh, the, and the Federal Zero Trust Strategy, if you're not familiar with it, it kind of breaks down actions that agencies should implement based on a timeline, uh, based on the five pillars of zero trust, right? One pillar being identity. Uh, one of the action steps within the identity pillar is that agencies implement phishing resistant authenticators for their workforce. Um, <laughs> I think it caught a lot of agencies off guard because it was like, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're doing these PCAB-based smart cards or personal identity verification cards, so I think that's a check in the box. Uh, but then when you start kind of peeling away the onion on it, you're like, okay, that's, that's great. So what do you do when, when an employee doesn't have that? Right? What's, what's your solution there? It's like, oh, well, um, a you know, two-week time-based password or you know, we use a one-time pin and... Uh, I think it was a, a realization for some agencies that had a very compliance mindset that it, this was acceptable kind of security practice. And so uh, I would say the Office of Management Budget, specifically the Office of the Federal CIO, right? They uh, worked with the ICAM subcommittee and the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency. That's two securities always catches me <laughs> when I say it. CISA takes um, security really seriously, so right. I have to say it twice. <laughs> yeah. So I, I also co-chair the ICAM subcommittee, and so we formed, um, at first we called it the community practice, right? But that word kind of has a connotation that uh, you come together, you kind of just talk about things, and then you walk away, and you come back, and you just, it's mo mostly talking. So to try to differentiate it from existing community practices, uh, we developed what we called it the community of action. Community of action, we defined it as like a time box community, small, usually about six to, six to eight um, agencies that actively run pilots, right? It's not, you're not showing up to listen. Um, you're ready to run. You have your executive level support, your CIO, your CISO, who's bought into the idea of 
running a pilot. You've defined what that pilot is, meaning that what architecture components are involved. Uh, the pilot includes a community that's representative of your production environment. So like five IT admins testing out YubiKeys or other security keys, that's not really a good pilot, right? You want to you want to break, um, you want regular users who aren't maybe familiar with new technology, you want to understand what are the challenges in the context of your mission, right? So some of the sample pilots that the community of action supported were um, overseas personnel, it included field personnel, like uh, USDA had, uh, well, it was either USDA or the interior, I can't remember which one it was, uh, but they had like um, firefighters in the field, right? Supposed to report back on tablets about the situation on the ground, and they didn't have any good multi-factor solutions for those tablets. Yeah. That was a perfect one. Um, just an alternative authentic authenticator, like what I mentioned, right? There's no kind of backup to the times around when an employee would normally have a, uh, a PIV credential. Um, <clears throat> so that was a perfect use case, and you could see kind of the risk tolerance of agencies and how they either wanted to uh, accept or use it as kind of a, a different type of policy exception. And so the whole point of the community action was just support that, right? This is a safe environment. You know, he, here are the sample pilots. We want to support you in what you're doing. Don't think of this as a compliance mindset. Uh, we're, we're about to finish up our second cohort. So I think we've had about 17 agencies that have run through it. And we're talking, I'm not talking like an office, right? We're talking major cabinet level headquarters, uh, USDA, the Department of Agriculture, one. Um, they're pushing out full FIDO as, as an authenticator to their 110,000 uh, person workforce. Uh, National Science Foundation is another one that's pushing it out. So these aren't like pilots, or these aren't par pockets of implementation, right? We're talking major full scale deployments here. Um, and like part of the session I did yesterday, I did kind of a, a workshop session, gathering input from the Authenticate people here and helping us understand what are, what are the evolving challenges that um, we're gonna add into a playbook. So that was kind of a follow up in June. Uh, OMB, CISA, and, and GSA hosted a, um, an MFA symposium that focused on FIDO adoption. And so the workshop yesterday was kind of a follow up to it. Switch back on. As follow up to that, I wanted to ask. So uh, yesterday on the main stage, Andrew Shikiar uh, from FIDO Alliance announced the publication of a new white paper uh, that FIDO put together, which uh, I, you know, would say was crafted as something to complement the work in the community of action. Um, you know, this was in part U.S. government officials actually at this event a year ago pointing out we've got top level policy in OMB Memo 2209 that says you need to use phishing resistant authentication, says you can be using FIDO2 authenticators as a complement to things like the PIV, where PIV doesn't always work. But there's a gap between the policy being there saying you are allowed to use it or you should use it, and then agencies knowing what to do. And so this was a paper that FIDO put together uh, through a combination of, uh, there's a number of US government agencies that are members of the alliance along with uh, companies. Uh, to try and drill down to that next level. Can you talk a little bit about that new paper and sort of where you see it complementing uh, the work that you've been leading? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the paper was totally a collaboration between FIDO and the, um, the FIDO2 Community of Action. Um, <clears throat> and it touches on kind of the biggest pain points from that mutual community, right? Life cycle management comes up all the time. Uh, um, I'm, you know, uh, my organization is so comfortable and familiar in how to do public key infrastructure based uh, credentials and lifecycle management. Uh, how do I do it with something that's not PKI? And honestly, I, I'm, taken, I'm taken aback by that question sometimes because we, we host these phishing resistant authenticator workshops We identify what are all the different types of authenticators being used. Like, oh, we have one-time pins over here for this use case. Maybe we, we can't support it on this old system, so we're still using passwords. And so just connecting the dot, like, okay, so you're already doing lifecycle management for stuff that's not PKI. It doesn't seem like a big, jump because it's just a new, a new type of authenticator. Um, that, I mean, th there's a, the, being in the federal government, the policy connection, kind of like what you mentioned, um, is always a big question, right? Homeland Security, Presidential Directive 12, is a directive for implementing um, personal identity verification credentials, right? But there's also a call out in there that can easily overlook that, yes, agencies must implement this directive, but continue to follow OMB guidance that comes out after it, right? And so that guidance right now is a combination of 
OMB Memo 1917, and the Federal Zero Trust Strategy, which is 2209. So um, at least with the, with the specific guidance, I think it's a fantastic collaboration and looking forward to more in the future. I'd actually like to add, I, I really do think that I, I do, I'd like to add a really big plug for that paper because, and by the way, I had nothing to do with the paper. I, I wanna add that, it's not, it's not self-serving. It's really, really good for anyone who is in the industry, even if they're not in the federal government. It really lays out in very plain language all the steps and all the things that you need to think about when you are uh, handing out um, any kind of credentials and like how to collect them and uh, how to how to get the authentication correct for those uh, individuals. So it's a really really good white paper just for like basic 101. I am not to keep plugging it, but it also was very helpful for us for me. <laughs> And this perspective, as we start to think about where do we have gaps in our guidance right now, where do we have gaps in some of the standards we put together, uh, to be able to hear what some of the specific pain points were from agencies, um, and really as we start to finalize 157-1, which again is our, our, derived, um, our derived authenticator guidance, which also kind of establishes this concept of the, the identity management within your kind of home agency and the ability to add additional authenticators and, and manage that more centrally, we're able to think about you know, what can we do within the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence to actually illustrate builds um, based upon different, different contexts, different tools, different technology, and really be able to illustrate through practical guidance you know, exactly how to do some of this identity management and linking of these different kinds of authenticators back to your core PIV identity. So. It's been a helpful process for us too. I'll just add one more thing. I mean, if you're either a government employee working in an agency and you hear you only have to use PIV, or if you're a vendor and you hear that from your customers, I mean, 100% reference that and then reach out to our office at ICAM at gsa.gov. Thanks, and I'll say, I mean, I think one thing it does to help agencies is answers to questions around authenticator lifecycle management. If I just have a PIV, that's easy to manage. If I have a PIV, and a security key and maybe a derived credential on my mobile device, now there's three authenticators that are out there. And how do you start thinking about managing things you know, across the authentication lifecycle, across the credential lifecycle? And so those are some of the things it tries to at least give uh, some guidance on. Uh, I want to shift to Courtney. So the IRS, as you point out, everybody's favorite agency. <laughs> yeah, and, um, but you guys are actually doing some cool stuff right now to try and transform how you deliver services. Uh, you can make things go easier for people through digital channels. Identity and authentication obviously plays a really big role in the work IRS is doing with you know, the way it serves Americans and the way it's hoping to transform things. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act was kind of a big piece of legislation for you. Can you talk sort of about um, how it's impacting your approach to, well, the digital channel? Yeah, great. Um, it's just such an exciting time, actually, to be working at the IRS. I know that makes me sound like such a geek, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but to your point, right, what we're doing in terms of you know, the identity proofing, the authentication, the authorization work is foundational to everything uh, that's done at the IRS. And almost the Inflation Reduction Act came at the perfect time for us because we had just started uh, you know, really getting down on paper a plan, uh, what was our vision for the future in terms of being able to have that consistent security and seamless experience across the channels. We'd also launched our new identity proofing platform uh, with uh, the Child Tax Credit Update Portal, which was really exciting for us. It gave us the opportunity to get uh, compliant with NIST guidelines and also to have people be able to get into the door that couldn't before. So our old system relied a lot on financial verification, so people without a financial footprint, uh, old tax return data, so people who are first-time filers. And, and we really knew, uh, we sped up <laughs> the release of that new platform because we knew that with how important uh, that legislation was that we had to get it right and we had to make sure people could get through the door. So with the Inflation Reduction Act coming, we were at the, just the perfect time um, in terms of being able to 
look, if you look in, uh, it's a, a public document, so I'm allowed to talk about it. Uh, <laughs> the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the strategic operating plan that's on Treasury's site. If you look at a, initiative 1.12, uh, we own that initiative, and it's really about being able to prov provide that secure, seamless uh, self-service across channels. Uh, what we're doing is similar in terms of the types of things that problems we're trying to solve to what we were doing prior uh, to uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's afforded us the opportunity to accelerate what we were doing. And so essentially, you know, we have the digital identity component, um, but then how can you uh, leverage that, leverage other types of uh, authentication, technology, policy, data that's out there to protect people's information regardless of the way that they need to get service or the way that they can. Because truth be told, um, you know, I don't want to look like I'm like waving a little American flag up here, but truth be told, everyone deserves to have their tax return data protected regardless of if there's someone that's going to go online. Or I think someone mentioned earlier people in caves that need to be authenticated <laughs> at the keynote today. So, um, you know, we're looking at what are the technology, the, the policies, the data sources uh, that are available for us to be able to deliver that. And I said to someone outside actually who had seen me speak a few years ago, um, at a working group, and I said, oh, I'm in a kind of a weird position this time, because instead of being the person that like has the information people want, I'm like coming being like, help me, help you, <laughs> like, I don't know anything about this. Um, but then he told me actually that that's exactly what I said at that working group too, so <laughs> I guess I'm in this position a lot. Um, but anyway, yeah, to your point, great time to be, to be in this type of work. Great. Well, I wanted to also, for those who are wondering, what does a bill called the Inflation Reduction Act have to deal with, uh, do with the IRS? Part of it was giving the IRS a big infusion of capital uh, to invest in upgrading its infrastructure, its staffing. Uh, so much of the infrastructure, obviously, that was you know, trapped in the paper world needs to be made digital, and so this is where identity comes in. So small part of a big bill, but when we're talking about it, it's really about IRS modernization. Yeah. Um, Shifting you know, slightly, so if I'm an American who's logging into the IRS, already my day has probably gone south because I have to do that. <laughs> right, exactly. But, but there's an opportunity here for you to deliver this little piece of joy to people who are logging in, which mm -hmm. is allowing them to do it without a password. So how are you looking at that challenge today and the ability to bring Americans joy in their interactions <laughs> with yeah, the Federal Revenue Service? That's, that's really what we're known for at the IRS, bringing joy. Um, I will say um, this is a space that kind of falls within uh, a larger umbrella that we're looking at. Uh, one thing you know, with our online um, identity proofing platform that we're trying to do is make sure that uh, folks have options, not just for that initial identity proofing, but how can we help people you know, have options when they're, we're, they're coming back. Uh, we are you know, looking, we're looking at that. I will say I am not IT uh, also, so I'm also a little bit of a fish out of water here. Um, I'm more on the policy side and business requirements use cases. Uh, we're looking at, you know, FIDO policy. So excited to be here at the conference. We're really looking forward to the new NIST guidelines um, and wanting to look at how um, would, um, you know, as a piece of that, looking at what's the impact in terms of the options that we can provide, what's out there um, that can help uh, with security, that can help with ease of access for that authentication space. And obviously you've got a challenge in that, you know, you pay out a lot of money, you collect money, so you're not really worried about the wrong people paying you money, I assume, because that's just all gravy on top. I'm, I'm so worried about that. Yeah. But, but you pay out tax refunds, yeah. which have been a massive target for fraud. And you also have a ton of really interesting data yeah. on people in terms of their, their tax history every year. Um, I know IRS, gosh, was it 
eight years ago, 2015, you know, went through a, a painful process when they uh, put an application online called Get My Transcript, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. which was protected with nothing but uh, knowledge-based verification questions. And I think it was 700,000 or 800,000 people had their... Oh, we don't like to talk yeah, about Yeah, we don't this. talk about it. Um, <laughs> So a, a blessed memory, we don't need to dwell on it, but it's an example of um, agencies are under pressure to put new services online, yeah. but if they're not protected, um, the bad guys are gonna come after them and make off with a lot of money, and in this case, a lot of people's personal data. Mm -hmm. So how do you sort of view you know, the, the current threat landscape and also some of the solutions that are out there to, in a way that you know, allows you to deliver digital services that can both stop fraudsters, but also make it somewhat easy for legitimate people to actually get access to their money, their data, other services. Right, I mean, I think uh, that is the big problem, right? So, uh, a, a few things, right, in that space. One is that we are uh, doing work uh, looking at various options. Our platform was built to have several different solutions, as I mentioned. Um, we have an, an IL-1 option with login.gov. We have another credential service provider that we work with. Um, and so we are constantly you know, doing that market research around what we can do um, in terms of offering options, both for, because it really comes down to, right, not just um, you know, having options provides many different people the opportunity. If you already have a login.gov account, fantastic. Use that to log in, you know. And so that's one piece. We do work very, very closely with our IT cybersecurity as well as the IT identity and access management group. Um, they're really in charge of uh, with the fraud monitoring. And then I'll say as well, I, I know a lot of you know, what we're talking about is in this digital space, but what kind of, uh, it's cliche, right? Like keeps me up at night, uh, which is actually my sleep apnea. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, is more so kind of those loopholes that the non-digital, because I'll tell you that um, there are risk mitigations that we rely on that then folks can get around uh, if they're willing to, to call, they're willing to take the time to go in person. And that's where you know we have some policy uh, that we've published internally, trying to kind of mirror the risk assessments that we do in that digital space, but for that non-digital space as well. Again, um, we're still kind of learning there. Um, and we also are trying to figure out what's the right balance there um, for folks coming in on those channels, as well as how can we offer options for that initial identity proofing, leveraging some of those other channels. So we did a, a pilot for in-person verification uh, for people to be able to go in person, identity proof there, and get their digital credential to be able to go online. So that's just a little slice of some of the things that we're looking at. Thanks. Um, Christine, so you advise a number of agencies on their approach to IAM. What are the things that you think agencies need to think about when it comes to taking a risk-based approach to authentication needs? Yeah, so I, this actually, I, I'm glad you asked that because I really wanted to ask, I answered the last question you just asked, Courtney. Uh, so um, one of the things that I was, I was thinking about when uh, Courtney was discussing is that uh, number one, their systems need to be modernized. So ident uh, identity um, providers need to be modernized, they need to be able to accept things such as FIDO credentials so we can actually have a safer way for citizens to be able to log in to uh, get protected information like at the IRS or also so we can have a better way for um, government employees and contractors to uh, log into their systems as well, right? On top of that, I think it's really important to look at other device level signals. So the obvious ones are um, you know, IP addresses, you look at watermarks that might have been placed on the device uh, during the first time login or because there's an EDR within the agency and they have that and, and it's a managed device. 
Um, and then also, what times are people logging in? You know, I, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know because I'm not a tax preparer, but I feel like, you know, 2 a.m. Eastern is probably not a normal time, but it might be. I mean, I think the last day of, of tax preparations is probably like your biggest. That's all day. Yeah. But, <laughs> but like, uh, like, I don't know, January 1st at 2 a.m., probably not a time that someone's trying to go and say, hey, I should be getting money back from the IRS, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, so kind of looking through what is, what is a normal behavior for the majority of the users and trying to make that baseline. And if the users are going outside of that normal behavior, you know, flagging it. Um, and then if it's extremely outside of that normal behavior, perhaps blocking that user and or uh, forcing the user to do something like a step up authentication that adds additional friction to the user before they can actually get access into whatever it is that they're trying to access. Great. And, you know, FIDO plays a role in there, but we're also talking about this year of contextual authentication tools that can augment some of those things. Yes, contextual or continuous authentication, however you want to call it. We don't have a baseline uh, definition for everything in Zero Trust yet, unfortunately. Maybe, uh, maybe Ryan can work on that for me. <laughs> no, no, no shortage of, of things to be uh, sending to NIST. Um, yeah. Looking to the Q&A online, somebody had a question. Does anyone have a link to the white paper that we were talking about on the FIDO Ooh. side? Um, I can't give it to you now, but if you go to FIDOalliance.org uh, on the website, uh, if you go to the white paper section, uh, it should be the first white paper. It'll say, I forget what the title is, but something about FIDO and the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. um, and we should probably do a blog or press release on it or something to highlight it a little bit more. I think you have. Yeah, you did, didn't you? Yeah, oh, you we did. We did a blog. Oh, never mind that. Thanks. Yeah. I, I saw it on LinkedIn. Go on LinkedIn. All right. Don't follow, apparently not on Jeremy's LinkedIn, because he, <laughs> he didn't put it out there. I'm, I'm better on Twitter, the platform formerly known as Twitter than LinkedIn. But uh, um, we've got some time uh, for Q&A. Uh, I've got more questions I can ask, but I kind of ran through the canned ones I had. So before I get to you know, improvise, uh, let me ask other folks in the audience who have a question. And if so, I'll run the microphone down and bring it to you. Lisa, I was, I was joking about asking questions. <laughs> I, I always have a question. Minutes. I thought I wasn't even but talking. But I, I, I do have a question about, um, we're talking about updating policies and NIST and OMB and all these kinds of things, and we're issuing um, FIDO credentials to users um, overseas, and obviously the pain point use cases we have, you know, non-PIV eligible, mm. or things of that nature, or somebody doesn't have their PIV card, has to log in. We don't want to roll back to password or weak authenticators. Do you see any updates coming out for like HSPD 12, uh, another life cycle management of the check boxes that we need to do for a user to, to be able to issue a FIDO credential, right, in place of a, a PIV card when they, they, they cannot get to one? So, you know, we have a big identity proofing gap going on, but if we can, do you see anything coming out down the way from OMB about guidance on how to issue a FIDO credential that's not a derived credential? Um, I, I can just say from a, like a policy perspective that you know, the last identity policy which came out in 2019, they usually go in a three to four year policy cycle. So I wouldn't be surprised if one comes out in the next couple of years. Uh, I would, I would be surprised if it contained, that seemed like very tactical information within it. If anything, it would probably follow a normal pattern like pointing to NIST on that information or maybe pointing to GSA, uh, like find information on idmanagement.gov. Like 1917 had a lot of references to, to uh, idmanagement.gov about that type of guidance. I'd also add, so OPM, uh, so for non-PIV use cases, there's uh, OPM memos out there that state uh, how, what to do if, if that's the situation. It also states when someone uh, is, uh, should be handed a PIV versus should not be, right? So I think that's very helpful. Um, and I actually, this is, I'm glad you asked this question, Lisa, because this is uh, something that uh, I got asked a couple weeks ago at Octane, which is essentially um, agencies are coming to some uh, FIDO providers and saying, well, this isn't allowed in our agency, 
so we can't do this with you, but we really do want to work with you. Um, and I said, no, that's not true. It's absolutely allowed and in fact encouraged because they don't, uh, OMB doesn't want you to fall back on passwords. So what are you going to do, right? Like you, we also don't want you to end up with like, uh, with OTP either. So phishing resistant is clearly stated in M2209. Uh, that's something that they absolutely want to happen. And, um, and so I think that the problem with agencies in some cases is they say, where in the policy does it say that I can do this? I'm actually a recovering attorney and the US, <coughs> it's unfortunate, I know, uh, the US government, the, the US system is not a civil system which says uh, essentially it has to be stated that you can do it, that's Europe. In the US, if, you, if it says that you cannot do it, then you cannot do it, but if it doesn't need to say that you can do it. There are clear instances in OMB memoranda that show that you actually can use uh, phishing resistant authentication and actually also can use FIDO authenticators within the US federal government. So in that, in that way, if you ever get a pushback from uh, customer agencies, it's, it's in the policies, it is allowed. And I don't have a microphone, but hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, I mean, if it's a practical question of like, how do we actually do things like, you know, we've got very clear guidance within our NIST documentation around how you issue a PIV card. Is there a need to fill that gap of, well, how do I now issue something that doesn't have necessarily a biometric tied to it or something like that? So I think, you know, those are things, those are use cases we're certainly willing to explore both within 157-1, but also potentially within things like the NCCOE to be able to standardize what are some of the issuance processes that might need to go into place for non-standard authenticators or non-PIV authenticators that might be temporary use cases, stuff like that. So if it's more on the practical side or the technical side, I think there's certainly things that we can do to try and explore how to help agencies better implement those. If it's on the policy side, uh, unfortunately, that's a little bit outside of the hands of NIST. Get your exercise. All right. Yeah. I need my steps. Other questions? <laughs> there's no way. There's no, there's no way. There's no other. Everybody's so, like, what, what the hell is NIST doing? What are they going to be doing? I, what do you like, think is happening? This is your chance. He's here. I, <laughs> I, I am running out this door and getting on a plane and getting out of here. It's you coming. are not. No, I'm not. Okay. All right. So I'm going to come back. You're going to be at the party tonight, right? There's a party? I hope so. Yes. There is. Yeah. So like, yeah, exactly. We'll go, we'll take them to the bar and then you can ask good questions. Maybe you can get <laughs> them right. to answer. So I, I, I got a question, uh, which is there is a, and, and there's a spicy debate perhaps uh, within <laughs> different parts of the federal government in terms of does the PIV really matter? Or does it, the only thing that really matters is that you just have some authenticator that's phishing resistant and we don't really care if the PIV is as a smart card there or not. Um, what do each of you think about that? I think I wish you asked Andy this question instead of me. Um, I mean, I think that at the end of the day, the way we kind of look at it is one, we've got policy that we need to write standards to support. Secondary, the PIV is more than just a form factor. It's the processes that go behind it to verify the identity of the user, um, to make sure that that person has passed all their su suitability checks. So it's, I think it's less about the idea of the form factor itself and more about the kind of holistic process that goes into the issuance. Um, and then from there, again, because of the fact that we have this, this idea of derived credentials, we can now give that person something a bit more robust. Um, I think the other thing that can't be forgotten is that PIV does not just support logical access. It's there for physical access. It's there for physical recognition of individuals walking around a facility. Um, so unless you're going to you know, put a picture on your, your FIDO token and walk around showing it to people, there's going to be gaps in use cases that still are going to need to be addressed by a consistent standardized authenticator. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got two mics, sorry. <laughs> I'd say, Ryan stole my answer. I mean, that's pretty much what it is, but I'll add, I'll add that in through the FIDO 2 community of action, I mean, I think I've pretty much talked to, you have your 24 COFACT agencies, which are your largest, largest, when you hear cabinet level agencies, those are them. I think I've talked to about 80% of the, at least the CISOs of those. And there's definitely a dynamic, right? It all comes down to, 
what is, what is uh, my organization's risk appetite to achieving our mission? So definitely on one spectrum, maybe if they have highly, not necessarily classified data, but highly sensitive data that they're very concerned about being in the public, then I would say they're more risk averse and want to go with the, I'm more comfortable when someone holds it in their hand and then uh, working on what they'll call edge use cases. And then they, the other side, which are more, we to fulfill our mission, we need to collaborate with all these different communities that don't fit nicely into a policy. And so we're, we're less risk averse. Like we're totally open to um, supporting uh, other types of authenticators. And that, and I mean, Ryan, you made an excellent point, right? Uh, there's some that interpret uh, HSPD 12 and PIV and that the ultimate thing is that there's a consistent standard for how, some, how an agency conducts a background investigation. And then it doesn't necessarily matter what you link to it, but the point is that there's a strong kind of binding, registering, whatever word you want to use between the two. Um, it just so happens that, you know, uh, uh, FIPS 201 came out, but if you look at HSPD 12, it says forms of identification. It doesn't say form of identification. So, um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what it is. It's like the, the risk appetite of that organization. Uh, I'm so glad you asked this question uh, because it's a really simple answer, for me at least, and that's uh, this is out of scope for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to you with a different one then. Um, I think he asked this question because he wanted me to get in trouble. Um, yeah, yeah, see, I knew it. Uh, so I, uh, I actually support four of the of very large departments that are also um, very security minded. Um, so uh, for them, the answer is extremely clear. HSPD 12 is there for a reason. A lot of the reasons uh, why uh, Ryan uh, stated, but also because I, if for those of us who remember what happened after September 11th, which is why HSPD 12 was created, uh, it was it was kind of um, chaos because in the federal government you didn't know who was a federal worker and who wasn't, and now there is a standard identity that shows that not only is this person a federal worker, but all like that you can use as a flash pass, or you can use in logical, or you can use in physical access, but it also uh, shows that that person was vetted to the standards of at least uh, a, a NACI, right, which is uh, a pretty intense background check. Um, so that's really important for a lot of departments and agencies still today, and they don't always agree uh, with the way that other people interpret how HSPD 12 is written. Uh, in my opinion, though, I think that it's really important that, um, that agencies do not uh, fall backwards into passwords. And in fact, if, if I had my way, I would kill the password right now. I hate it so much. I don't remember my passwords ever. Um, I am the worst person with passwords. So like, I need FIDO authentication. I need phishing resistant authentication because I can't remember my passwords. So I think that I, I think that there is 100% a risk, uh, a question on the risk tolerance, uh, and that's why I have uh, pushed, yelled, pushed a lot uh, to NIST about uh, how maybe the risk, uh, the what's it, what do you guys call it? The risk mitigation, what is it called? The risk analysis it's might, risk assessment. yeah, it might need to change slightly um, to be able to to bring in other things such as device level signals. Um, and I do think that the fact that we are moving more towards zero trust really helps us so that perhaps um, strong, uh, the PKI authenticators are not as necessary uh, and getting phishing resistant as a whole would be better. Um, but that being said, <laughs> and, I, and this is not my, I've heard this throughout industry, a lot of industry invested a lot of money in PKI and uh, you know, and they and they have been pushed by a lot of agencies to keep that investments in PKI, and um, so there's a lot of money that actually went into PIV and CAC, and that's really important for not only the federal government and the industry, but also the industries that support it. And the last thing really is that there's a lot of attributes. Uh, that can be attached into uh, a card that can be important if we ever get to ABAC, but you know, that's, that's in 20 years from now when we turn this into a, an ABAC conference. 
instead of just a fishing resistant conference. <laughs> How did any of that get you in trouble? I know, I, I did a really good job of not getting in trouble, didn't I? <laughs> uh, I, I guess the, the one thing I want to add to that, and if folks, I mean, the one thing to add is, is when we think, start talking about and thinking about killing the password and we talk yes. PKI versus FIDO authenticators versus, you know, sync authenticators versus not synced authenticators, there are a lot of layers of IT legacy within the US government where it might not matter whether you have a PIV card or a FIDO authenticator or FIDO2 with WebAuthn, you might still not be able to get rid of that password. And so I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of assumptions that we can just get rid of these things by changing some of our form factors when actually we also need to be starting to look at things like, well, maybe this can't accept some kind of, um, you know, modern authenticator. Are there ways for us to start to phase out these applications or are there ways to implement things like federation and stuff like that to help bridge the gap where you don't necessarily have the ability to directly consume some more modern authenticators. So just passwords aren't dead yet and they're not going to go away until a lot of our legacy stuff is completely removed from systems. So. I want to add one more thing because I do build zero trust systems. So the way that we do that, we deal with the, the, those really uh, monolithic legacy ugh, annoyances is we build them into enclaves so that there's at least a way to uh, protect the, uh, you know, protect the exterior of that by using more modern systems to get into it and more modern things such as device level signals and phishing resistant authentication. And then once you're inside that very uh, ugh, ancient archaic enclave, then passwords are still used. Um, but at least on the outside, there's enough of protection that I, I, I feel I can sleep a little better at night at least. Is that outside called a perimeter? Yeah, that would be what I would call it. You're right. <laughs> so I want to go. We've got, by the way, I'm not just trying to find a new defense for my fantasy football team this week. We actually have questions coming in on the app. Um, I do got to work on that afterwards. Um, <laughs> one of them was asking about how is the U.S. government engaging internationally? And, you know, this, it's always particularly with 863, actually a lot of other, you know, NIST special pubs as well. It's crafted officially as guidance for U.S. government agencies, but then a lot of the private sector points to it. A lot of regulators will tell regulated industries they should look to it. And then you even see other countries across the globe point to the NIST work because, frankly, a lot of them don't have the resources or the know-how to do what NIST can do. So one of the questions was on the, from an international cooperation perspective, are government agencies on standards and best practices working with other uh, governments, collaborating in different channels. Uh, and so, I, you know, knowing NIST has been doing some things beyond the U.S. as well, I wanted to hand that to you. Yeah, I, so we have, a no so first of all, NIST purview is not purely to work on U.S. federal government standards. It's also to represent U.S. government interests, interests within international standards organizations. We actively participate in ISO. Um, we're looking to get more active in W3C. Um, we have right now what's called the Trade and Technology Council, which is a, uh, a, a presidential um, initiative to engage and better collaborate on trade-related efforts with um, the European Commission. Uh, so we have a, an established mechanism, uh, and underneath that we actually have a specific working group that is focused on digital identity. Um, so at the moment we're actually working directly with the European Commission to map 863 into some of the EI DAS operating regulations uh, and be able to establish some initial foundations for cross-border interoperability, at least from the standards perspective. Um, the other thing we're looking to do with that same group is be able to establish what are some of the international standards that we're all pointing to, what are some of the international specifications that we're all looking at, and how do we make sure that we are coordinating to the greatest degree possible our pre-standardization efforts and our coordination within those standards bodies, because they don't always necessarily represent national interests so much as the, the interest of the members who are from that nation in that group, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so looking to coordinate there closely with, with the folks in the European Commission, we've also got independent engagement going on with our colleagues in uh, DSIT in the UK, um, in Canada with the Treasury Board. Um, we're actually presenting tomorrow morning at like seven o'clock in the morning uh, our time here uh, to the uh, ID for Africa group and we're looking to engage a little bit more directly with, with the folks on the African continent. So um, we are very active internationally to the greatest degree possible within our kind of resource limitations. We've also got you know, that purview at least to engage in the international standards body. And I'll add GSA is part of the Trade and Technology Council as well too. 
All right. Well, I think we are just at time. So really good panel discussion. So thanks, everybody. And uh, you. if you've got other questions, you can grab them later. Uh, we'll have a five-minute break and then come back with uh, the next session, which I believe is leveraging passkeys, pat, leveraging passkeys for a federated federal government environment. Federated and federal back-to-back. -back. That's a tongue twister. Anyways, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.